Okay, besides transferring mass to each other, binaries are also revolving around each other. They're going around each other, around their common center of mass. So one star is doing this. Okay, let's say this is the heavier one. The, the, the heavier one is moving sh uh, shorter, and the, heav the lighter one is moving around that. So they're both moving around their center of mass. Now, revolving binaries, if we discover them, they are an excellent way for us to predict the mass of stars. So revolving binaries are best way of finding out the mass of stars. All we need to find out is their separation distance from each other and their period of revolution, and then we can solve for their mass. So we can just know what, how far apart they are. We can determine how many days it takes them to revolve around each other. For example, if we study uh, two stars from uh, here on Earth, and we see, okay, it looks like the two stars are six AUs away. Okay, six AUs. They're just giving an example. And then uh, in 1982, it starts like this, and then 1984, and then 1987, and then 1990, and then 1992, this, this star is back to its original path. While this star was doing this, this one was also making a smaller loop. The heavier one makes a smaller loop. The lighter one makes a bigger loop. So based on this example, they, de they determined that it takes them 10 years to go around each other. Their period of revolution is 10 years. And then their separation distance was 6 AU. 6 AU. So they use a modified form of Kepler's third law. M plus M is A cubed over P squared. So they take their distance from each other. They cube it. Uh, we, we did this law back in lecture three of the... Uh, of the series, we, we talked about Kepler's laws. So they take six cubed, their distance, they cube it, they divide it by their period squared. Six cubed over period squared, 2.16. What does that mean? That means the mass of this plus the mass of that equals 2.16 mass of the sun, okay? Then they need to do some measurements and stuff to determine their individual mass. They, they need to do, to calculate separately. But at least they know that the combined mass is equal to twice the mass of the sun. You see? So the Kepler's third law comes in handy there. Okay, within this category of revolving binaries, there are three major kinds. There's one that is called visual binary. That means they are, the two binaries are so far apart, they're revolving around each other. When we look through our telescopes at these binaries, we actually literally see two stars. So it's easy to spot them. We see them as two stars. So they are so far apart that they are visible to telescopes, but there aren't many of these. Okay? Their period of rotation might be as much as 100 years because they're far apart from each other. They are very rare. There's maybe a handful of these that if you get a telescope, you're able to point and you're able to look and you're able to actually see that there are two, tele uh, two stars and then you're able to look at their uh, you know, period of r rotation. So. There's a few, few of them, but they're very rare. Example of them is we've talked about these two stars a lot, Sirius A and B. Sirius A, remember, is the brightest star in the sky ever. It's the brightest star in the sky. That's it. Sirius B, you cannot see with your naked eye. You need to buy a telescope. So if you ever do buy a telescope, you can actually study them. You can buy, look, go, look through your telescope, Sirius A. Next to it, you will see a star, Sirius B. And they're revolving around each other. But it takes them 50 years to revolve around each other once. So it takes you a whole lifetime to study them, you know, to study this revolution. Okay, another good one that is easy to study 
it, they're in the Big Dipper, they're called Mizar and Elcor. Mizar and Elcor. They're also a visual binary pair. You can buy a telescope and study them, and you can see they're going around each other. Okay, other ones, they're called spectroscopic binaries. These ones happens to be, maybe they're not that close to each other. So when we look through our telescope, they look like a single star, okay? And to our telescopes, they look like a single star, but they're actually two stars going around each other. So how do we determine that? We study their spectral type. So they are the most abundant kind of binaries, most abundant. They occur when the plane of revolution of the stars does not face towards the Earth. They don't eclipse each other. However, the only way we can know that they are revolving is to study their spectral lines. We study the spectral lines of these binaries and something known as the Doppler redshift, Doppler blue shift will take place. The spectral lines will experience a redshift and blue shift due to the Doppler shift. Example of these, Marzar and Elcor. Okay, now we, I believe I mentioned Marzar and Elcor in the previous page, right? They were an example of what? Yeah, they were also an example of visual. So just because you're visual doesn't mean you can't be spectroscopic. If you're visually, if you visually see a star as being a binary, you can also study their spectra and know that they are experiencing blue shift, red shift, blue shift, red shift, okay? But the other way around is not, uh, could happen. You could study a binary pair that is spectroscopic, but you look through a telescope, they still look like a single star. So that wouldn't be visual, you see? See, this, this is the direction to Earth. These are two stars going around each other. So initially, when the star is in this, in this location, their spectral type are overlapped, okay? Look what's gonna happen when I press play. See, See when star B is coming toward us, its uh, spectral lines are blue shifted. When star A is coming towards us, its spectral lines are blue shifted. So look what's happening. Blue, this is uh, blue shift. That one is red shift. Okay, if I pause it for a second, let me pause it right here. Okay, so at this instant, what's happening? Star A is coming towards us, right? So we're, what's happening? A, A, A. You see its spectral lines are blue shifted. You see? What is star B doing? Moving away from us, you see? Its spectral lines are red shifted, you see? Towards the red. Now if I pause it. At the same time, star B is moving. Okay, so now, now pause it. Star B now is coming towards us. You see? Its lines are blue shifted. And A is red shifted. You see? So. That's a very helpful way to study their spectra. Eclipsing binaries. We could also study the, these ones by studying their spectra. But they have an extra advantage that they're the way that they're revolving each other, they're actually eclipsing each other or occulting each other. It's called occultation. They are the most helpful ones because not only can we study their spectra, but we can actually see their brightness dimming once in a while. They help us not only to find the mass of stars, but also their sizes, the size of stars. So eclipsing binaries are a good way to tell and measure size of stars. They happen when the plane of revolution of the two stars faces towards the Earth and the stars eclipse or occult each other. This is known as an occultation event. 
Okay? So when two stars are going around each other, it happens to be like this. And then one comes in front of the other one, the other one goes behind the other one, and they, they are revolving in each, around each other in such a way as their plane of revolution faces towards the Earth. So it's kind of rare to happen, but when it does happen, they're very helpful. Let's see what this picture shows. Okay, you see here? You have a star, they're going around each other like that. Now look at their plane of revolution. It's facing towards the Earth. So when star, this one comes in front of that one, you see here, this is this one. This one comes in front of that one. What is, that, what is it going to do to the brightness of that one? Dims for a while until it comes out. Then it starts getting brighter again. Then it goes behind that one. You see? So it goes, you see, it goes like this, comes in front, comes in front, now goes around. Now it's going around, right? It's going around. It's going to come behind it. You see that? It's going like this. It's going to go behind it. When it goes behind, it dims a little bit more. Uh, sorry, a little bit less. Actually, when does it dim more? This one or this one is a more dim? It looks like this is a bigger dimming than this one. Why? Because the big one is very bright. You see? So you've got a really big bright star. You've got a small one going uh, in front of it, and it dims a lot. Now, the small one is very dim already. And so when it goes behind the big one, the brightness of the pair doesn't dim as much. So it doesn't dip as much. So the red one hiding behind the blue one is not affecting the brightness of the pair. And then when it comes out, it goes back out again. So it says, uh, see dim, small star in front of large star, dim, large star covers smaller star, you see? So it is rare to find eclipsing binaries. Eclipsing binaries can be studied by studying their light curves and noticing their apparent luminosity drops every once in a while, just like I was showing you. Examples of these, which ones are they? Algol, which we've already seen before also. And uh, we see that in Algol, you've got the pair, <coughs> excuse me, you've got the pair of stars eclipsing each other every 69 hours. And then you've got another star, W Ursae Majoris, which we al also saw. And then that happened to be when we saw it first time, we said it's an overcontact binary. That means they were so close to each other, right? And when, when we study their revolution, we notice they eclipse each other every eight hours. So that actually makes sense. They're very, very close to each other. W Ursae Majoris.